those iconic scores, if you think about Indiana Jones or Star Wars, all these incredible uh, pieces of music were recorded and heard for the first time. The Bowers and Wilkins loudspeakers give to our recording sessions. And I think if you ask any of the engineers why they use them so much and enjoy using them so much, it's very much a case of what happens on this side of the glass is absolutely transparently and honestly represented in this side of the glass as well. If you want it to sound like a Bowers and Wilkins product, you have to use the Bowers and Wilkins drive unit philosophy as best as you possibly can to replicate that. Here on HDTV Test, I've banged on and on about faithfully reproducing the creative intent, mostly from the picture point of view. But what about the audio side of things? To find out, I spoke to Bowers and Wilkins, who are responsible for the premium audio solution on flagship Philips OLEDs, as well as Abbey Road Studios, where thousands of film scores have been recorded. My name is Andy Kerr. I'm the director of product marketing and communications for Bowers and Wilkins. And would you like to explain the work you've done with Philips TV on their 2022 sets? Well, I think what we're trying to do in this generation is to introduce an even broader portfolio of choices uh, and along the way potentially reach even more potential customers. So the idea here with the two models that we're going to talk about today in particular is to give both a development of the established concept that we already have of a high performance external speaker enclosure and also to revisit an idea that actually formed the initial foundation stone of our partnership with Philips TV, the product we call the Ola Plus 903, if you recall that model. And that's this model right here. That's the Ola Plus 907. So what that has is an integrated audio system, as you can see, and that we hope makes this particular model more appealing to the broader range of customer than perhaps the more performance oriented solution represented by the other model we've got here today, the Ola Plus 937. From the front of the TV, the integrated sound enclosure doesn't look as dominating as the original 903. Can you explain the audio driver units and other components that you have tried to squeeze into this sort of space? Yeah, that's a great observation. So if you look back to the original 903, of course, that was a 2.1, fundamentally left and right, with a rear-mounted uh, subwoofer enclosure. So the first thing, of course, that we wanted to do with this product is to go with a left-center-right configuration, an LCR, and that reflects, I think, some of the knowledge and the development that we've had over the course of the subsequent generations of products uh, with external speakers enclosures, all of which have had that kind of configuration. We feel having a hard, physical, real center channel speaker significantly improves dialogue lock, significantly improves clarity, and it's something that we wanted to make sure that this model has. But as you point out, of course, you've still got to fit that into a relatively constrained space. So what we've tried to do is solve the problem by actually creating three independently constructed speaker enclosures within the primary assembly, each of which is fully decoupled. So they essentially float on isolating mounts. Now I've got one here if I can show you. And as you can see, this particular one is from one side of the system with the tweeter assembly over here. So that would sit in this part of the product over here. And as you can see, what we've got are these four compliant mounts. So these compliant mounts essentially allow this whole thing to as best as we can possibly achieve it, float within the speaker array. And it fundamentally is in its own right, a small, dedicated, separate speaker. Uh, of course, what we've also got there for beyond the, obviously the driving, as you can see, is you know the fact that we've got two mid-range cones as well. So we've got smaller 30 millimeter mid-range drive units. You can't have the same diameter and size of mid-range drive unit as you'd have in a larger speaker array, such as the 937, because of course that would increase the vertical height and that would make this overall system much larger and more difficult to fit elegantly underneath the panel. So there are some constraints, but by designing it with, as you can see, this asymmetric configuration, the angle profile, what we've managed to do is make it look minimal and elegant from the front, but at the same time actually give it a decent amount of acoustic volume at the back. And that decent amount of acoustic volume means that although those drive units are relatively small, they're operating in a good size of space relative to the enclosure. And that means in turn we can get a good amount of output from them. The high frequency units are high quality as well. They're the same, the proven 19 millimeter titanium dome that we've used for some time. So component wise, some variations in approach, some variations in choices, but at the same time, some continuity in thinking as well. Uh, and as I say, by having these three compliant floating assemblies in there, we're confident that we compensate for essentially the close proximity of the speaker enclosure to the panel without at the same time agitating the panel as the speaker enclosures operate. And of course, that's all important, as I said earlier on, to ensure PQ. Now, that said, 
these relatively small drive units, they then need some assistance in order to ensure that you get a meaningful amount of output. And this is where you get a really big step change between 907 and 903. 903, you might recall, had a much smaller subwoofer assembly um, with just a pair of ABRs. This is a very substantial design, as you can see, with a 75 millimeter woofer in a volume which is about 40, 50% larger than the volume of the older generation product. And it has four auxiliary base radiators or ABRs, two here and two, as you can see, on the back. And what those four working together with that enclosure mean is there's a really good amount of output from this subwoofer assembly. And that in turn means we compensate, if you like, for some of the scale issues that we have by having the slightly smaller mid-range cones firing forward into the room. And of course, this whole thing, rather like previous iterations when we've done this, like we did with the original 903, is also on compliant mounts. So it's in a floating space at the back of the panel. It's gonna float fully in space. And that in turn means again, although it's operating and giving a powerful output, it's not driving the panel and causing any PQ related issues. The last thing worth emphasizing on top, of course, of the transducer improvements is signal path and output power. So it's using a higher quality latest generation Dolby processor, and we've got 80 watts of output across the system. So it's a powerful and at the same time discrete and well integrated system. It's not attempting to try and compete with the capability of the Ola Plus 937. 937 is undoubtedly the most sophisticated product that we've had yet in terms of numbers of drive units in terms of iterations of thinking. As you can clearly see, it signposts some of the preceding generations of product that we've done in this particular category. Of course, the Ola Plus 934, 935 and 936, as I mentioned, it builds upon the proven thinking of those products, but it introduces some new technology for the first time. It introduces additional drive units and new capabilities as a result of that. It's the most comprehensive product yet. I think one of the things that gives us some of the opportunity with Ola Plus 937 is for the first time, because we have the 907 below it, this model is restricted, if you like, confined to the larger screen sizes. So this is available either in the 65 inch model that you can see here or the 77 inch model, which of course is dedicated to the hardcore movie loving enthusiast. By virtue of having that screen sized selection on board, we can scale the audio system appropriately because we don't have to think about going down to a smaller panel size as we have in the past with 48 inch and 55 inch. We know we've got, if you like, a kind of minimum viable width for our speaker enclosure that pertains to the 65. It's the same across both products, we don't change it. And as a result of that, that additional space gives us more opportunity to achieve more. We've got a good amount of internal acoustic volume and we can, of course, as I said, build upon that 3.1.2 speaker configuration from the outgoing Ola Plus 936. If you think about high frequency, it's building upon that proven platform because that works so very well. So what we have are the 19 millimeter titanium dome tweeter, each of which is housed in its own fully decoupled assembly. So these sections here have a kind of slight compliant mount. They go in the extreme ends of the speaker enclosure. Of course, the one in the middle is that iconic Bowers and Wilkins tweeter on top configuration now in its third iteration, 935. 936 and 937 and of course what it helps to do in particular is create a nice broad and immersive sound stage that brings the audio experience up and helps it to match well to the acoustic center. In terms of the mid-range drive units we're building upon our proven 45 millimeter drive units which are a woven composite material. There are four in this design so you've got one at the extreme end and two in the middle flanking the central tweeter on top. Low frequency also again building upon last year uh, it's a 100 millimeter by 65 millimeter unit, as you can see, with a very substantial magnet and motor, which in turn gives it uh, good extension, good excursion. And it's cosy well braced, as you can see, in terms of the uh, stiffening features on the cone assembly there as well, to try and make sure that it stays in shape for as long as possible. This is a ported system. So a significant portion of the back of the speaker enclosure is essentially the acoustic space, the port for this to operate into, and it exits from the rear through the proven Bowers and Wilkins flow port technology. So that deals with the left, center, right. The other part, of course, is how do you deal with immersion? Now, last year, we used a pair of these paper cone diaphragms, and as you can see, they have a slightly steeper profile. If I put the two side by side, you can see pretty clearly what's going on there, that slightly steeper profile. That steeper profile is designed to allow these to beam more. What we're trying to do is essentially focus 
uh, a more narrow beam of energy. These are full range drive units, unlike those which are dedicated mid range drive units. And that's trying to create that upward firing immersion that allows the Dolby Atmos system to work effectively. There are still two of these mounted in the top of the system and angled carefully to fire upwards. The addition in 937 compared to 936 is we have a further pair of these mounted at the extreme ends of the assembly in these side firing angled enclosures here. Same type of drive unit, same purpose. So essentially what they're doing is handling the function of rear or surround channels. The angling feature is designed to help them pick up first reflection, so off any adjacent wall or surface or boundary. Uh, and like we've done in the past with center channel and with Atmos channels, we provide a manual gain control adjustment. So if you feel that you need to get more level, more output out of them, perhaps because your nearest adjacent wall is a degree further away, you can turn up the level and the output to try and focus more energy onto that surface and try and create a broader, more immersive sound field. So fundamentally what we now have unlike the last iteration, which was 3.1.2, is we've got a 5.1.2. Left, center, right, right rear, left rear, plus the subwoofer, plus the two Atmos channels. As a result of that, total overall output power has increased. It's now 95 watts for the complete system, and essentially that extra power is there to accommodate those two additional channels of speaker output. Isn't it just easier to buy, let's say, a Philips OLED TV and an external soundbar such as the Sonos Arc? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a question we get asked a lot, and I think the response is fairly straightforward. The speaker enclosures for these products are designed to complement them and are optimized to their respective screen sizes. Of course, there are very, very many high quality soundbar options out there. Um, the key point to understand, of course, is that there's no way for any of the designers of those soundbars to understand what size of panel you're using, or indeed the relative distance from the soundbar and that panel. The obvious example would, let's say you have the panel on the wall and the soundbar sitting on a piece of furniture below that. There could be quite a considerable difference between, if you like, the acoustic sensor, which is where the point of emanation of the minority of the sound comes from, and the viewing sensor, the viewing sensor of the screen. These are designed holistically. Uh, although the audio systems don't vary from the 65 inch to the 77 inch, the tuning does, and the tuning takes account of that variation in distance that you naturally get from the acoustic sensor and the viewing sensor, and tries to make sure that you get that appropriate alignment of those two experiences. Of course, it's also important to say that if you mount this product on the wall, the speaker enclosure will go into a slightly different position relative to the panel because of the nature of the adjustment in the bracket. But within the setup, when you configure the product and tell it that you have it on the wall mount, then naturally the appropriate adjustments are applied to ensure that you get the compensation back to make sure those two relative distances stay intact. In other words, to summarize it all, what you're watching has to align very closely to what you're hearing if you're gonna get what we believe is the fullest and most comprehensive experience from ownership of any TV with any audio system. There are many different ways to do it, but we believe this is one of the most elegant and essentially the most comprehensive in that it provides a fully optimized solution however you're mounting the panel whether it's on tabletop or wall and whichever size of panel you choose to buy whether it's a 65 or a 77. If you were to go for something like this don't forget everything comes on one plug it's not two there's no cable connections or setup beyond the initial installation and everything operates off one remote control so there are other benefits to the holistic approach that go beyond simply the acoustic performance one. I'm Jeremy Huffelman. I'm the general manager here at Abbey Road Studios. Uh, I work across all of our brand partnerships, and particularly the partnerships we have with Bowers and Wilkins and Philips TV. Now, when people talk about Abbey Road, we always think about the Beatles, but Abbey Road is so much more than that. Can you please elaborate on what Abbey Road means to you and also everyone? Yeah, I think Abbey Road is probably one of the most famous or recognized studios in the world. We're 90 years old this year, in fact. Um, the association is largely driven, I would say, by the Beatles and, and artists like Pink Floyd, and we're incredibly proud uh, and, and, and grateful for that heritage. But obviously that was nearly 50 years ago now, and there's a huge part of our story which a lot of people aren't aware of, and not least of all the contemporary artists who still use the studios to this day. We're an incredibly busy facility. We have multiple recording, mixing, mastering studios. We have our own institute, our own music tech incubator. 
Um, so there's a lot of different strands to the to, to the business, and there's a lot of new artists and contemporary artists who use the studios, uh, like Stormzy and and Kanye West and Frank Ocean and Dua Lipa. On any given day, the studios are full of contemporary artists. But there's also another side to our business, which even fewer people I think are aware of, which is the film scoring side of things. So in 1980, uh, we started to score films in Studio One, which was at the time relatively underutilized because it was an era of pop and, and classical or orchestral recordings were fewer and far between in those days. So the decision was taken to, to, to build a, a film scoring business. And since then, we have been one of the UK's premier film scoring facilities. So we have done thousands and thousands of film scores. And on any given day today, there will be typically a film being scored in there. Um, the second film we did was Indiana Jones, Raiders of the Lost Ark. And we have done six of the Star Wars films, the Harry Potters, Lord of the Rings, the Jurassic Park series, a lot of the, um, of the Marvel films. So Avengers, Endgame, Black Panther, Black Widow, many, many others. So culturally, it's kind of for a lot of people, it is, whether they know it or not, it's actually the place where the movies that they love were scored and, and seen for the first time in the music, those iconic scores. If you think about Indiana Jones or Star Wars, all these incredible uh, pieces of music were, were recorded and heard for the first time. So yeah, a, a huge, huge part of our business is film scoring. I see that Philips TV has also entered into a partnership with Abbey Road Studios. Would you like to elaborate on that? Absolutely. So um, we are now partnered with Philips TV as Abbey Road's official TV partner. And we have this incredible opportunity to sort of join the dots of the synergy between Abbey Road and Philips TV and Bowers and Wilkins. Um, each of these sort of each of these brands are fundamental to our processes within the building, if you like. So the loudspeakers, as you can see behind us, obviously are used at the control rooms. The TVs are fundamental to our scoring business as well. Obviously, we're watching the cues that for each of the films in the studios, in the live rooms. The musicians are watching the TVs, and obviously the directors of the productions are in the control rooms with our engineers and the producers of the music, actually using them as the reference, which which the whole score is based around. So it's fundamental for us that we have the best possible visual experience for our clients who are creating their art and it's being seen for the first time. So when you actually connect the dots around Abbey Road, the fact that the loudspeakers are essentially part of the sonic identity of a lot of these spaces and now the Philips TVs are part of the infrastructure for our film scoring but also in all of the control rooms so everybody's experience in, on every session that uses televisions to some degree it actually seems to be the perfect kind of synergy and we see an expression of those values of excellence and certainly innovation and, and craft across our relationships with Bowers and Wilkins and with Philips TV and it's kind of one of those scenarios where we're all aspiring to the same thing, which is essentially we're trying to translate the emotion of the creators of the art to as many people as we possibly can, as well as we possibly can. Ultimately, that's what we're all engaged in. That's the enterprise we're all trying to deliver. And I think we work incredibly well together to deliver that for our clients and also the broader public who ultimately are watching the films and listening to the music. So hopefully you have gained some insights into why Philips TVs with Bowers & Wilkins sound system should get you closer to hearing the creator's intent than any other in-TV speakers. But all this is going to be in vain if you don't get the picture looking right, and you may not be aware that there's one sneaky setting buried in the user menu on your television, which will make the picture look darker than it should be. To find out what this sneaky setting is and how to turn it off to improve picture quality, please watch my instruction video by clicking here.